The city of New Westminster was built along the shores of the Fraser River in British Columbia, Canada. The river itself has served as a home for animals, people, and industry alike over the years. The mighty Fraser provided an easy transport route and source of energy, which allowed industries like fishing, longshoring, sawmills, canneries, and more to thrive along the river. Reclaiming the New Westminster waterfront is a collaborative research project, which explores the changes along the waterfront, which has evolved over time to residential and retail space. We conducted over 80 oral history interviews with former workers and residents of New Westminster, who described the ways that industry used to impact the river. I think if you, if you talk about the river specifically, it, it seemed to go through a couple of what I would call significant changes. Uh, you know, as I was involved for the latter part of the 70s and through the 80s, it was kind of like uh, the wild, wild west on the river. You still did whatever you wanted to. Nobody cared about the environment or, or you know, not, not I just didn't care, but it wasn't the focus like there is now. You know, so to me, the first sort of major change in the river came when people started recognizing, you know, the value of the habitat. And, uh, you know, as, as everybody can probably recall for years and years, all the log booms that were, I mean, the, the sawmill industry on the river now is like, peanuts compared to what it used to be back in those days and so there consequently there were m many more log booms that were brought in and stored on the river there. but for the most part they tended to keep the booming grounds toward the edge of the river uh, so they had more room for navigation I presume and, and just let the log booms go high and dry and, uh, when the tide was low when the river was low they just sit on the bottom on, along the shoreline and, and then when the tide came up they'd float again and nobody thought anything of that until but somebody realized that that was killing all the, you know, those areas that are intertidal are the ones that are, are the health of the river. The log booms mm -hmm. are sitting on the mud flats, killing all the eelgrass. So, you know, provides oxygen to the river and supports mm -hmm. life. So that was kind of a, I would say, a major sort of change. That's the unfortunate part of the, the river in the 1950s. It was a, um, a universal uh, waste bin. You know, and again, no one knew better. But um, when I, you know, I joined the Port Authority, you'd go up past the Scott paper, and you always knew what shade of toilet paper they were producing, because at the end of the shift, it'd be pink or green or blue coming mm -hmm. out. And then if you went up uh, past Royal City Cannery, next to the Westminster Railway Bridge on the Upper River side, um, if they were doing peas, then all the husks would come out, or all the apple cores. <laughs> it was just, that's what happened. The issue of industry is a contentious one in New Westminster. For years, many residents were employed in the many industrial areas along the water. On the other hand, many of these same residents recognized that industry may have played a role in the destruction of the river. Many have proposed a mix of industrial and residential land use in the area, but most industries have been pushed out of New Westminster by a combination of government and local citizens. While there's still work along the New Westminster waterfront, the nature of it has changed, and so has its relationship to the water. As an environmentalist, as I look back, you know, I'm horrified as to the way we treated the Fraser River. Uh, Webb and Giffords had just hatches in the floor of the machine shop, and everything that was the leftovers from the machining, the oil, the carbon tetrachloride, the cutting fluids, which of course is outlawed now, uh, and all of that uh, was just went straight down into the Fraser River because we were on pilings, and the, the currents of the river actually swept right under our building. And all the uh, the toilets for the office uh, and for the machine shop it was just a straight. Okay. So that's part of the history of uh, the Fraser was seen as a never-ending uh, receptacle mm -hmm. for anything you wish to dump. Uh, to where we are today, we still have issues, but we and we have certainly moved a long way. It's the lifeblood of the province. If we don't, if we, if we abuse this river, I don't know what's going to happen to the fishing industry, the lumber industry. A lot of times, it, it's just backing off on some of these animals and let them, you know, let them have their space. So, you know, yeah. you provide them with habitat, stop persecuting them, and stop poisoning them, yes. and they can do the rest. You know, for a mm -hmm. lot of them, and they'll come back. So, you know, people. A lot of people are really worried about the environment. We hear all the negative mm -hmm. stories and mm -hmm. things, and they unfortunately people are, uh, don't dwell on the positive side of it and say, "Well, let's look at both sides of the ledger here." And if you look at the positive side, you say, "Okay, well, the eagles are back, uh, ospreys have come back. Ospreys were extremely rare, and now they're nesting right here in the one of the pines on Annis Island. The trumpeter swans, or they thought they may go extinct, are now back, and it's all because of this. You know, you back off on the persecution." and stop poisoning them, give them some space, and 
you know, they can come back to them.